this is going to be a stream on basically how to deploy a Django app to AWS LightSail. We've been planning this stream for a while. We've been wanting to do something a little bit different than what we usually do, which is um, create courses on our Udemy channel. So shout out to everyone who's joining us from our Udemy courses. And also we, uh, we usually post tutorial content and stuff on YouTube, but we wanted to try, try out doing a, a real time live stream and um, see how that works. Basically what you'll need to follow this tutorial set up on your machine is um, you're gonna want an AWS account. Ideally you have uh, sign up to the AWS free tier or if you already have an account, then just use that account. Uh, ideally you have an IAM user that has kind of administrator access that you can um, use from your local command line interface. Uh, Docker desktop, so you can use Docker. You can you can either install Docker desktop on your machine or you can use something like uh, Kalima, which I'm using on my Mac OS. As long as you have Docker and Docker Compose installed and accessible, then that should be good. The AWS CLI, you'll need that installed locally. There's um, instructions on how to do that on the AWS website. And then the AWS LightCell container plugin, which is a plugin for the AWS CLI that works with AWS uh, LightCell containers. And then I recommend using AWS Vault to manage your credentials locally on your machine when you are authenticating from your local machine to AWS. So let's take a look at what we're gonna cover. We'll just recap. So what we're gonna cover is creating a Django app locally. So we're gonna create a, a Django app on our local machine, and then we're gonna deploy it to AWS LightCell using their containers service, which is a relatively new service. It's kind of similar to Heroku in that it's kind of a low effort deployment solution that has very clear pricing. Unlike the um, the real AWS or the other AWS tools, it gives you a very clear list of the pricing as you go. So you know you're only gonna get charged $5 a month or $20 a month depending on the services you bill. It's not going to charge you based on usage and things like that. So typically it's a fixed price per month for the services for how long you're running them for. We're also gonna be setting up a database. So we'll use RDS database on LightCell, but we'll have a local database for development. And we'll be using the Django admin, which is a very um, popular request. Like people, when they use Django, one of the main benefits of using Django is to use the Django admin. So we're gonna show you how to set that up locally for the local development, and then also deploy it to LightCell and use it in LightCell. And then as part of that, we're gonna to need to handle uh, media file uploads. So if you wanna build an app that allows users to upload files to that app, and let's say they wanna upload profile images or something like that, then you'll be able to do that and I'll show you how to set that up. That's one of the challenges people typically have with Django is how do you manage the uh, static media files especially when it's deployed to production. Hopefully you got a chance to see the video that we did, um, I think it was a week or so ago, where we explain the things that you should have set up in order to do this live stream, just the tools that you want to install. I'll just recap them again now, so you have a chance to go and do it if you, if you haven't installed them already. So the first one is an AWS account. You might need to, to give a credit card and things like that when you sign up. So please go ahead and sign up for an AWS account. Um, if you're new to AWS and you can use the AWS free tier, which should give you, it should mean that it's pretty much free to complete the steps in this course. Um, don't hold me to that. You have to be responsible for your own costs and looking at the cost, but it, it does show you in the dashboard as you create things, how much it's gonna cost. For this project that we're gonna deploy, I think it's about $25 a month if you were to leave it running all month. If you were to just follow it for this course and then delete the resources, it'll be significantly less, um, you know, it'll be, probably a few dollars um, just to follow the steps and then delete them. Okay, so you want an AWS account and then you also wanna have Docker desktop, so you wanna be able to use the Docker command and the Docker compose command. The easiest way to install this for most people is to use Docker desktop. Um, if you want to use an open source alternative, because I know that Docker desktop have introduced licensing, then you can use something called Kalima, which is a, um, a tool that allows you to use kind of the native Docker open source version on your Mac OS and it also works for Linux. And then if you're on Windows, then I think if you don't want to use Docker Desktop, then just install it on the Linux subsystem. You also want to have the AWS CLI. So if you just Google AWS CLI, it will come up and then you can install that on your machine. And then the AWS LightSail Container Services plugin. So this one's important. You're going to need this in order to push images and stuff to AWS CLI. And then you also want to have AWS Vault. This is um, something that I recommend. It's to manage your AWS credentials and to be able, be able to authenticate with things using multi-factor authentication with your local machine. I can just go through the, the pages um, where you can install those tools quickly. Um, I'll just uh, I can close this off now. 
Okay, so the tools that you want that, that I listed, uh, the AWS account, if you just search for AWS free tier, then it will take you to the page where you can click on free com cloud computing service, create an account, follow the instructions on the screen. I, of course, already have an account ready to, to go for this session. And then Docker Desktop, this is how I recommend you install Docker. Uh, just search for Docker Desktop. You got it here. If it's Mac OS or um, Windows, oh, it supports Linux now as well. Um, so whichever operating system you're using, just install this. It, it will give you both Docker and Docker uh, Compose. It should be the easiest way to get up and running. And then the AWS CLI. So if you search for AWS CLI, this is the command line interface. Um, you go getting started. There should be an installation guide somewhere. So installing or updating to the latest version of the AWS CLI. So you should be able to find it here. It has the instructions for Linux, Mac, and Windows. And then the AWS LightSail Container Services plugin. So that's this tool here. And this is a guide here to, to show you how to install that. And then AWS Vault is on the 99designs um, GitHub page. So this is a free tool that they provide and it's, it's fairly easy to install. It shows you how to install it here. I, I install it using um, Homebrew. All right, so I think we've covered everything and I think we're ready to get started. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're just gonna set up a Git project. And what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll create the Git project and um, I'll put it in the chat. And as we're going, I'm gonna push to, to Git or push to GitHub. So if you want to um, look at the actual code that I'm pushing after I've kind of done the step and stuff, you can do that um, on, uh, by, by clicking on the link to the repository. I'm gonna make it a public repository. So we'll do this, I'll call this tutorial um, Django light sale. And then um, live stream code content for deploying uh, Django to light sale. All right, so I'm gonna make this public and then I am going to set up a git ignore for Python and I'm just gonna leave the license, uh, MIT license, so you can use this for free for your own projects if you need. Okay, so this is set up, and I should also mention that the, the final version of the code is on the, uh, the notes of this channel, so on the description of the video, you should be able to see the uh, re re final repository. So if you do get lost or you join us a bit late and you wanna kind of catch up, then you can see all of the code there. I'll, um, I'll just go to it now. So github.com London app developer and repositories. So it's this one here, so tutorial. And then all of the steps that we're gonna be following I've listed here and you can actually see the code diff on your local machine as well if you click it. So it tells you the changes to make. And now this is just if this is how you prefer to learn if you like, if you want to see it on your screen and you have multiple screens and stuff like that and you wanna actually see the code as we go. If not, then don't worry, I'm gonna be doing everything on the screen that you can see. So you, we're gonna type everything out as we go, which is why we might not make the full, uh, might, might not get it all done in the full two hours, but, but we'll try our best. Okay, so I've got the project. Now I'm gonna clone this project to my local machine. So I have a directory called workspaces. Um, I'm just gonna do git clone and pull that down and then I'm gonna open that up in the editor. So I'm using Visual Studio Code as you can see here. This is my preferred editor nowadays. You of course can use that any, any editor that you're comfortable with as long as you can change the text that we need to change in the files that we need to change them in. Okay, great. So the first step is to set up Docker. So I like to run all of our projects using Docker and we're gonna be deploying with Docker. So this is gonna be used for both the local development and the deployment. There are many benefits to this, such as having a consistent development environment on prod and dev. So you, you, it's the same application on prod and dev. And it just makes it a lot easier to debug issues because you know that the code is gonna be literally the same on your lo local machine as it is on the deployed server with just a different configuration. It also makes it easier when you're working on professional projects and you're sharing the project with other developers, it makes a consistent and easy to use development environment. So I always build everything using a Docker and a Docker Compose file for the local development environment. There are some exceptions which I'll go through as, as we go. We're gonna start by creating a Docker file. So let's create a new file and we'll just call it Docker file. 
And this is a Django project. So we're going to do from Python colon 3.11.1 hyphen Alpine 3.17. Now this is quite a specific version. I recommend using this exact specific version whenever you're following this video, because that means the steps in the video are always going to be exactly the same. And then once you get to the end of the video, you can always upgrade the packages then. That's my recommended approach, just so that the steps that we record in this video are the same when you are actually doing them. So if you're interested where you get this image from, you can get it from the, uh, the Docker hub. So hub.docker.com. And uh, if you just search for Python, the official Python image is here. And you can see they've got like thousands of tags here that you can use. Um, we're using the latest version at the time of recording and I'm pinning it to Alpine 3.17 just to make it sure it's consistent. Okay, then I'm gonna type env python unbuffered one. And what this does is it, it unbuffers the output. <laughs> so what it means is just the, the Python application um, will always output the logs that it prints to the console straight to the output of that container. It's recommended, if you look at the Docker documentation for creating a Python app, it's recommended setting whenever you are using Python in Docker. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is type copy, all caps, dot forward slash requirements dot txt to forward slash requirements dot txt. And what this is gonna do is gonna copy a file called requirements, which we're gonna create in a minute in our project and copy it into the Docker image that we're building. And then we'll type run python hyphen m v e n v for virtual env forward slash py and then double ampersand backslash. And then we're gonna type forward slash bit, uh, pi, sorry, pi slash bin slash pip install hyphen hyphen upgrade pip. Then double ampersand backslash and then forward slash pi slash bin slash pip install hyphen r forward slash requirements.txt. So what this does is it's a run command. So when it's building our Docker image, it builds the image. And then when it gets to this step, it's gonna run python hyphen m v n v forward slash pi. So this is gonna create a virtual environment inside the Docker image. And this is gonna be used to store all of the dependencies that we install. Now, some people say you don't really need a virtual environment inside a Docker image. And you, they're probably right in 99.9% .9 of cases, you probably don't need to do this because you can just install the packages directly and Docker is so lightweight that it probably won't have any conflicting packages already in that image. However, just as a best practice, I like to do it just because it gives you more control over the virtual environment inside your Docker image. So if you're basing from Alpine, it's very stripped back and lightweight. But if you're basing it off another image, then there might already be Python packages and stuff installed on that image and uh, they might conflict with what you're doing with your app. So I like to just create it as a preference. And then this ampersand ampersand backslash is just a way to create a new command on a new line without adding another run command. The reason we do this is because every single command we do in, in Docker is cached as a separate layer. So for efficiency, we don't wanna have separate run commands when we can just put it all in one line basically. So next we're running pi slash bin slash pip install. So this is running the pip command from our new forward slash pi virtual environment and it's doing upgrade pip. So just make sure we have the latest version of pip on the image. And then we're running forward slash pi slash bin slash pip install hyphen r requirements.txt and this installs the requirements file that we previously copied that we're going to create in our project in a minute. Okay, so now what we need to do is type env path equals and then double quotes. It's very important to use double quotes here because if you don't use double quotes, then it's not gonna work properly and you're gonna have strange issues. So we're gonna type forward slash py forward slash bin colon and then dollar sign path. So what this does is it adds our new Python virtual environment, which is gonna be set up at forward slash pi and then all of the binary executables are under bin. And it adds us to the path, which means that when we run commands in our containers that are created from this image, it will be able to access the dependencies and stuff that we've installed into this virtual environment uh, without having to specify this long version of the command here. So it's just a convenience thing, really. And then we're going to type copy dot forward slash app forward slash app and then work the forward slash app. So this app is a directory we're gonna create. Let's just create it now. 
And we're just going to create an empty directory for now. And it's going to contain our app code, basically. And then we're going to add our requirements.txt. And in our requirements.txt, we want to install Django. So the time of making this video, Django equal equals uh, 4.1.5. This is the latest version available at the time. Again, like with the tag in the Docker file, if you're following this at a later date, I still recommend you use the versions we specified here just because it means that the steps will be consistent. And then at the end, you can upgrade if you want. Okay, the next step is to create the Docker compose file. So we're going to go docker-compose.yml and I'm going to type services colon and then app colon and then build colon and then context colon dot and then back to the, the line where build is, so the, the indentation of build, we're going to type volumes colon and then dot, uh, hyphen dot forward slash app colon forward slash app. So what this does is it creates a, a service in our Docker Compose setup. It sets the build context to the local directory. That's why we have build context here. So we want to build from this directory. You can specify subdirectories if you want, but we, our Docker file is in the root of the project. So that's why we just need a dot here. And then we have volumes and this maps a volume. So the volume is going to be from app to forward slash app in the container which is the work dir that we specified in Docker files. So the reason we do this is so that when we change code on our local machine, it is updated in the running container and vice versa. If something changes in the container, it gets reflected in our local project, which we are going to use right now. So that's the Docker setup. I'm just gonna do git add git commit Docker setup and push this for people who want to see it on the GitHub project. Hopefully I created this project um, as a public project. Let me just double check that. Yeah, public. So you should be able to see these files added now. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create the Django app and a Django project. So open up a terminal. So if you're using Windows, it'll be like PowerShell or Command Prompt. If you're using Mac or Linux, it'll just be the terminal. And you're going to change to the directory of your project. And then you're going to do docker compose run hyphen hyphen rm app sh hyphen c python oh no not python sorry getting ahead of myself uh django hyphen admin start project app dot close quotes so what this does it runs docker compose it says docker compose run we want to run a service using docker compose the rm says after we run this delete the container because we're just running this command as a one-off we don't want it to be lingering on the system and app is the name of the service we're running. So that matches app here. And then sh-c says we want to run a specified shell command on our app service. And the specified command that we're specifying is in the quotes here, which is Django admin start project app dot. And there should be a space after app and dot here. Okay, so once you've typed that out, you can hit enter. And what this will do is it, it might take some time to pull the containers down if you don't already have them cached. Mine was pretty instantaneous. I already have this cached on my machine. But what this does is it essentially will create a new Django project. And because we have the volume set up, you can see the Django project was created in Docker, but it is reflected on our local machine. So the next thing that we're going to run is the same command again. So docker compose run rm app sh hyphen c, but instead of the Django admin command, we're going to type python manage.py start app and we're going to call our app publish because it's just going to be a simple app that allows us to publish some content to a page just just for demo purposes it's not going to be anything super extravagant or, or um, complex here because we just want to demonstrate deploying to light cell we don't want to build a really complex app we just want to show how to create the, the essential bits okay so we'll hit enter there and you can see i didn't get an output this time because it didn't have to build the container or anything like that because it's already built and cached, but you can see it added the publish app here. So essentially that's all we need to do for now. Actually, there is one more step that we'll do here. So um, all of this code has been auto-generated by Django. The one thing that we wanna do is change our Docker Compose here, and we're just gonna add port colon hyphen 8,000 colon 8,000, and then uh, command colon python manage.py run server 0.0.0.0 colon 8000. 
So what this does is it changes our deployment setup so that we map port 8000 in the container for the app service to port 8000 on our local machine so we can access the local development server. And then the command we're running is the command to run the Django development server that it comes with out the box. So this is the server intended just for development purposes. You're not supposed to use it in production. We're just gonna use it for our local machine in development. So we specify the IP address 0.0.0.0 because we want it to bind to that IP address instead of just local host. And this will mean it's accessible via the mapped port here. But this is specifically because we're running it in a container. If we were running it locally, you wouldn't need this, this bit here. Um, you only need this for the container version. Okay, so let's go ahead and head back to our terminal and just type docker compose up and this will start our server. I'm just looking at some of the uh, the comments here. Thanks a lot, um, Oliver, appreciate it. Um, I don't know how, how I helped you, but um, I'm glad that the stuff that we produce is useful. Thanks again for the, for the comment and for joining, appreciate it. Okay, so now we're running our server. Um, we can go to the browser and we can go localhost 8000. And you should see this page. So this means that you're you're running Django locally on the local machine. So this is good. This is the kind of standard page you get with Django for all new projects. Okay, brilliant. So um, I'm just gonna push this to GitHub now. So I'll do this in a separate tab. Git add, git commit, and then um, added Django project. There you go. So I'll push that. All right. So we can move on to the next step now. So we've created the Django project and app, and now we're going to configure the database. All right, so we're gonna configure a Postgres database for our app, and we're gonna start by doing it locally. We will be deploying this to LightSail, I promise, but we'd need something set up locally first for us to deploy. So the first thing we're gonna do is open up our requirements, and we need to install the driver that's used for Django to communicate to Postgres. And we'll do that by installing the SciCop G2 I have no idea if that's really how you pronounce it, but that's how I like to say it, Psychop G2. Equal equals uh, 2.9.5. Just for reference, you can see all of these on the um, pip uh, package manager. Um, that's not the right pip. So we do pip, so you can search them all here on pypy.org. And um, so if you wanted to search Psychop G2, it will come up. And it also gives you the information about um, how to install it and stuff like that. And that's gonna be important here because you're gonna find that you can't just install it like you can most Django requirements. You have to add some additional requirements to your operating system. And in our case, we just have to do it to our Docker file. So those packages are packages that are needed to install Psychop G2 driver basically. So it is documented on their page, but I'll just explain to you now what you need to do. So you type run apk add hyphen hyphen update hyphen hyphen no hyphen cache and then postgres hyphen client and uh, build hyphen base and then postgres ql hyphen dev. So these, these are Alpine packages. So APK is the Alpine package manager. It's like apt if you're using Ubuntu or something like that, or it's, I guess, kind of like brew if you're using Mac OS and you have brew installed. Um, so this is how you install additional um, operating system level applications on the Alpine based images. And um, we're doing APK add, which means add a new package. We're doing hyphen hyphen update because this is a um, Docker image. We're just gonna update the uh, index so it has the updated list of packages that are available. We're saying no cache because we don't want it to cache any of the stuff on this container. We just want it to install it and that's it. And that's just best practice to keep the Docker container lightweight. And we're installing Postgres client, build base and Postgres QL dev. All packages that are required to install Psychop G2. Okay, so we can test this by just going ahead and typing docker compose build. And this will go ahead and build our container, our image again. It'll give us some error if we have an error here. So it looks like I have an error here. So I think I um, just spelt something wrong here. So I spelt, um, yeah, Postgres client should be Postgres QL client. Let's see, did anyone point that out in the, oh, is Psychop? 
three now the new version released I, I don't know i haven't i haven't i didn't hear of that but if that is then uh thanks solar solar system um for pointing that out i don't know if that is the the latest version or not but if, if you say it is then i'm sure it is a new version that's been released i'm just going to stick with um version two for now because i know it works with the um, version of postgres now that we're using but i will take a look at that later on after the stream appreciate you letting me know okay so i'll run docker compose build again okay this time it succeeded so it installed the packages that we needed all right so the next step oops we don't need to see this we need our code the next step is we're going to modify our uh, settings.py file so i'm going to close those off and, and open up settings.py which is an app for such app settings.py and we're going to start by doing import os so this is really configuring our settings.py to use a database and also to work in production. So import OS, and then we're gonna do secret key. And as you can see here, this is Django insecure. It's given us a temporary secret key. Now, you, you shouldn't commit this to Git. We're not gonna use the secret key, so it doesn't matter that I already committed it. So I'm just gonna delete it, and I'm gonna type os.environ.get secret underscore key, and then change me. What this does is it pulls the value secret key from the environment variables and allows us to set it as a configuration value as opposed to setting it as a hard-coded value in the settings. And this is the best practice recommended approach when you are deploying a Django app. You don't want to have your real secret key inside the uh, settings.py because the secret key should be a secret key. And if you're sharing it with every single developer on the project, then it's not very secret. So uh, we leave it as change me here because this can be used for local development. That, that doesn't matter too much. But for production, when you deploy it, you want to set this as a configuration value using environment variables as opposed to hard coding it in the project. So that's why we do this. Next, we want to also make this debug configurable. So we'll do that. It's a bit tedious, this one, but this is how I like to do it. So I do bool which is the function for converting um, a value to Boolean, int, which is the function for converting a string value to an integer, and then os.environ.get, and the, we're gonna get debug, all caps, and we're gonna default to zero. So what this does, we work from the inside out. So os.environ.get is the same as this, so it gets an environment variable, and it also returns a default value for that variable if the variable is not set. Now, environment variables can only have one type, and that is string. So you can't set an integer value or a Boolean value using environment variables. So we can only use it as a string. So in order to get around that, we um, expect either a one or a zero, and that will be passed in as a string, and we'll use int to convert that to an integer. And then we will use bool to convert the integer to a Boolean, and this will give us the true or false value needed for debug. So this is how I like to do it. There's many different ways you could do it. You could have an if, if statement here or something like that. Um, I just, I find this way quite nice and easy to use. You just have um, debug equals one or debug equals zero, and by default, debug mode is off. So we only set debug mode on our local machine, which we'll do in a minute. Next is the other one that's a bit tedious, is these allowed hosts. We're gonna need allowed hosts in order to allow us to access the application on the host name that we are using on AWS LightCell. So when debug mode is on, it doesn't matter which host name you connect to. So you can use local host or whatever. When debug mode is disabled, so when you're on production and not in debug mode, you have to specify the, the host names that you're gonna use for your app. And this is a security feature of Django. Um, if you read in the Django documentation, it'll explain more about it and the details of why. All you need to know is that you need to specify the host name, otherwise you're gonna get a 400 bad request whenever you access your um, app. So we need to be able to provide a list of hosts because you might have multiple hosts for one app. We need to be able to provide a list of them to allowed hosts. So the way I like to do that is with this um, bit of logic here. So I leave the existing allowed hosts as an empty, um, an empty list. And then I add allowed hosts.extend and then filter and then non, and then os.environ.get allowed hosts, and then an empty string dot split, and then a colon, or sorry, a, a comma in quotes here. So it looks like a little face, and then, or it looks like a little penguin face. 
And what we do here is um, we basically, we pull in allowed hosts value. And as, as I said, they always come in as a string. But if we want to set multiple, then we can provide a comma separated string. So we can provide each host name as a comma separated string. So we split that by the comma. So if you provide multiple via a comma, it will split it into multiple items. But if you um, don't provide anything, so you leave it blank, then it, it returns none. So we want to filter none out. So that's why I um, use the filter function here. So filter out none as a result. So if we're using local development mode, it will uh, not extend it. And then we're using extend, which is a way to add items to a list. So the os.environ.split um, will split it up and return a list. And this extend allows us to extend the existing allowed host list by another list. So it will populate the values. This is how I like to do it. There's many different ways of doing it. If you have a preferred way and you're already familiar with this, then feel free to ignore this and just do it the way that you prefer. It really doesn't matter too much. This is just how I, I prefer to do it. Okay, in um, installed apps, we're gonna add publish. And we add this because we've added the publish app. Uh, I, I appreciate we've gone off on a bit of a tangent from the database here. I just wanted to get these kind of settings set up first um, because we're going to need to do this at some point anyway. But now we're going to move on to the actual database related settings. And uh, that is here. So if you scroll down to like line 84, you've got um, the database settings and we're going to leave default. We don't want to use SQLite. So we'll do um, Django, django.db.backends SQLite and we'll change it to .postgres. QL. I keep forgetting the QL at the end. So dot Postgres QL. And then host, we're going to do host. We're going to get that from os.environ.get db underscore host. And then uh, name, we're going to get os.environ.get db underscore name. And um, then the user will get from os.environ.get db underscore user. And then um, password we'll get from os.environ.get db underscore pass. So what we're doing here is we're getting the environment variable configuration values for our database. We're passing it into host name user password for the database configuration for Django. And this will allow us to configure our uh, database. So we'll be able to configure our local database when we're on local development, but we'll also be able to use these environment variables on LightSail when we deploy it to LightSail in a moment. Okay, so that's everything in the settings.py file. Now we're gonna move it back to uh, Docker Compose, Docker Compose.yaml, and we're gonna modify the command. So with Django, you need to basically do this, um, I, I like to do this greater than symbol, sh hyphen c, and then python manage.py migrate, ampersand ampersand uh, backslash, and then this is just how I do multiple commands in here. This is the syntax for running multiple commands in uh, Docker Compose. So we're starting with the migrate and then we're gonna use Python manage.py run server 0.0.0.0.8000. So this, um, when we start our server, it will run the migrate, which will run our database migrations. That's how Django manages the database. And then we start the development server. I have a couple of questions here, so maybe we'll just take a quick little look at the questions. So Solar System, um, I've read that Python Slim is recommended for backend instead of um, Python Alpine because wheel packages are not supported. So you need to figure out many dependencies why we use Alpine. So that's a, that's a good question. I haven't heard that um, Python Slim is um, is recommended. I have seen it used in lots of places as a default, a default uh, container base or image base. A lot of it comes down to personal preference. I find that Alpine is the most lightweight Docker image that you can use for this kind of thing. And usually when you're using Docker and you're spinning up lots of containers, lightweight is better. That's why I prefer to use Alpine. But obviously you can use whatever you want when you're working on projects, feel free to use um, Slim. I think Slim is, is a, if I understand, it's kind of like a stripped back version of Ubuntu, which um, has very minimal stuff on it. It's probably perfectly fine to use that as well. If, you, if there's a link or something and there's an official documentation that suggests it, then I'd, I'd be interested to see it and I'll, I'll certainly look that up after the stream. I appreciate you, you mentioning that. J James Foreman, so how much is this application gonna cost to run an AWS per month? I think it's gonna cost $30 a month. We're gonna be using RDS instance, which the cheapest is 15. We're gonna be using a container instance. 
which the um, cheapest is, I believe, is $5 a month that we're using. And then it, we're gonna be using S3, which I think is also $5 a month, but it tells you as you go along. And for these steps, you, you, get, you only get billed if you use them for the full month. So if you just create them and delete them, you shouldn't get billed for the full month. You only get billed for the time that you use them. You know, there are cheaper options available for sure. This gives you the benefit of using AWS resources that are generally quite reliable and kind of production grade at a fixed cost so you don't need to worry about the cost of like data transfer and stuff like that the cost is is fixed for what you buy which is one of the benefits of lysel okay so hopefully that answers your questions thanks for thanks for asking all these great questions now we'll continue um with the with the steps so what we're doing here is we're setting up our services and we're going to now add our database service because we're going to need a database locally to develop and uh, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to create a new service for database. Um, so we'll type database, colon, and the image we're gonna use is uh, Postgres, colon 12 hyphen Alpine, and volumes, we're gonna use dev hyphen db hyphen data, uh, colon forward slash var slash lib slash Postgres QL forward slash data. And then environment, we're gonna do hyphen postgres underscore db equals django hyphen dev hyphen db. And then postgres underscore user equals dev user. And then hyphen postgres underscore password, whoops, missed the underscore. Postgres underscore password equals dev password one, two, three. And I'm gonna talk through what these do after I've typed it all out. So feel free to just type it out with me. Don't worry, I'll explain it. If you don't understand it, I'll explain it after we've typed it. So we'll do health check colon test colon and then in, bra in the square brackets here, the first string is CMD and the second one is gonna be PG, whoops, PG underscore is ready and then comma hyphen Q and then comma hyphen D and then um, uh, after hyphen D we're gonna do Django hyphen dev hyphen DB and then we'll do hyphen capital U so uppercase U and dev user and then we're gonna type interval colon 5s timeout colon 5s and retries colon 5 and then volumes at the root will do a volume called db um, hyphen, uh, sorry, dev hyphen db hyphen data colon. All right, that's a lot. So let me just talk through this. So we define a service called database. This should be level with your app service here. So just make sure your indentation is correct. It's very important with the YAML files. The image we're using Postgres 12 Alpine Sorry, Solar System, I know you're not a fan of Alpine. We're using Alpine for Postgres um, for now, but this should work the same if you choose other, other images as well. Because um, what happens here is we now map the volume, db-dev-data, and um, we map that volume to forward slash var slash lib slash Postgres QL data. And this is just to keep persistent data on our local machine. So every time we stop the service and start it again, we don't lose any test dev data that we have created. This volume name here should match the volume name that we created here, which it doesn't look like it does for some reason because I, I typed it wrong. Apologies, I typed it wrong. This, this volume should match. So let's call it db hyphen dev and then make sure that matches. If it doesn't match, then it's not gonna work. So, okay, this matches now and this is all mapped correctly. And then we have environment variables and this is how you configure the Postgres um, Docker image or the Docker container to set up our initial database. So we're creating a database called Django Dev DB, and we're creating a user called Dev User, and we're creating a password called Dev Password One Two Three. Now I don't, I usually hard code this because it's literally just used for local development. No one should be able to access it from externally anyway. Then we specify a health check. So with Django, there's an issue when using Docker and Docker Compose. There's an issue with um, a race condition where if you start Django and you, it starts the database container the database container sometimes starts, but then it takes a, a few seconds for the actual database to be created and for it to set up the initial database. 
So sometimes Django errors out and says um, it fails to start because the database wasn't available, even though Docker Compose said it, the, the service was started. So what this um, health check here does is we run a test here. We're gonna do CMD, which is command. P, this should be PG is ready. That stands for Postgres. So PG is ready and then hyphen Q is quiet because we're running this, um, we want it to run in quiet mode because we're just running it as a test command in the startup process. Hyphen D specifies the database. So this should match this database name here. So you see they match, I got it right that time. Then hyphen user is the user we want to use to check if it's ready and that is the user we created here. So you've got dev user here. So this health check we can use to ensure that the database is up and running before Django starts. And um, the interval is just how many times it tries or how long between tries. The timeout is how long will it wait until it tries again. And the retries is how many times will it retry before it considers that it's just not gonna work. And we set it to five. Okay, so there's just a few small changes to do now. So underneath command, we're gonna type environment and this is in our app. So we need to configure our environment variables for our app container. And we'll do that by typing debug equals one and then db uh, host equals django hyphen dev hyphen db and then db underscore name equals django hyphen dev hyphen db, uh, sorry, host should just be database and db name should be django dev db which matches the db name here and db underscore user equals dev user. That should match the user that we're using. So you got dev user, dev user, dev user. And then db underscore pass equals dev password one, two, three. So what we're doing here is we're configuring Django to use the same settings that our database is started on. So the host is the name of the service. So Docker sets up a network in the background or Docker Compose sets up a network in the background and the name of this is going to, the database is going to be accessible on the host name database from our app container. And then the database name is the name of the database we created here. And the user is the name of the user and the password is the name of the password. So the last thing here is to just add the health check. So we want to say, we want to tell the app, the app container or the app service to wait until the database is passing this health check before it starts our Django app. So we're going to do that by typing depends underscore on colon then database colon and then condition colon service underscore healthy okay so we can save that so this just says um, this service the app service depends on the database and the condition is that the service must be healthy so that the database must be healthy before the Django app starts okay so that was pretty intense but we should be there for our local setup so we'll do docker compose uh, let's just see if it's running. So it's not running anymore. If your service is running, you might wanna stop it. Just do control C and then do Docker compose up. And we should see hopefully this works. So it's starting our database. There's a delay because it's waiting for the health check to pass and the health check passes and then the app starts. So this suggests that it's all working properly. This is how we want it to run. If we go back to our um, local host 8000, you can see that it started and that the app is running and you can see in the logs that it applied our migration successfully. So the database is now officially set up on our local machine. I'll just quickly answer some questions. So will we be defining an end file? So um, uh, no, we're not gonna be doing that here because we're not gonna use Docker Compose to deploy. We're gonna manually configure the end file, the environment variables on LightSail. An end file, we do use that sometimes if we're using Docker Compose specifically for deployment, but we're gonna be using a different service for deployment in this one. So um, no, we're not gonna be using an, en an ENV file. And um, are we covering stack files, domain, and SSL? So SSL is set up by default by LightSail, which is great. So yes, that, that will, be covered, but it's provided for us by LightSail, so we don't need to do anything. Um, static files, yes, we will definitely be covering static files. And domain, I don't plan to cover that, uh, but I can show you the tab. It's pretty straightforward and easy to use if you just do it through the, um, the console. So maybe we can take a look at that if we have time, but um, static files and SSL, yes, we, we will be covering that. Okay, so we configured the database. Now we're going to actually go ahead and create a, a little publish app or a little basically placeholder page 
that we can actually deploy. So before I go ahead, I'm just going to push this to git. Added DB. Great. So it's pushed if you want to see that on the, um, the GitHub repo, uh, London app dev demo forward slash tutorial Django light cell. Uh, you can follow the code along there if you want. All right. So we're just going to create a real quick little app here. So I'm going to open up URLs. Uh, let's start by creating a template. So in um, publish, we're going to add a new file, but I'm going to create it inside publish forward slash templates forward slash publish forward slash index.html. So this is um, the recommended place to put templates in Django when you're working with Django. And I'm just going to do quickly HTML head title uh, publish index page and then body and we're going to do h1 hello publish page this is just a little hello world type app that we can deploy so i really want to make sure we get to the actual deployment to light cell <laughs> before we run out of time we're going to do this and then we're going to deploy it we're almost at the light cell part don't worry okay next we're going to do um a view so in django you create views we're going to do df index request and then um, we're going to add a, a doc string here. Render the landing page for the publish app. I like to be pretty consistent with doc strings, although sometimes I might leave them out if it's a really simple function. I can delete that. And um, then I'm just going to do return render request and then publish forward slash index.html. And you might notice here the little warning. So this is something people ask me about all the time. Um, because we use Docker and all of our dependencies are on Docker, Visual Studio Code can't see that we have Django installed. So it says Django can't be resolved because it can't see it because it can't access it in Docker. There are um, four ways of dealing with this. One is you just ignore it and you just don't you rely on this um, thing which I'm going to probably do here just in the interest of time. The other way is that you configure Visual Studio Code to run inside Docker, which I'm definitely not going to cover here because that is a really tedious and in my opinion, quite a painful process that I don't like to use that just because it's so complicated to set up. But we do have a video for that on our channel and also on our website, londonappdeveloper.com if you're interested to, to learn how to do that, although it's not my preferred approach. Uh, the other way is you just set up a virtual environment locally on your machine. That's usually what I end up doing just in the interest of time. I don't like that I have to have dependencies local machine and in Docker, but just to get this kind of autocomplete working and that I, I sometimes do go ahead and do that for projects. So feel free to do that. You just set up a local virtual environment in the project and just install the requirements and that should get rid of this. The fourth way is just to disable this, um, these, uh, the PyLance plugins so that you don't get them. And, um, but then you obviously don't get the benefit of it as well. So, so really you, you just pick the way that uh, works for you. We'll just leave it for now because I don't want to take up too much time by going into detail of that. If you're interested, we can, um, we, if you put a comment in and you're interested to know that, then we can maybe do a stream on that another time. Okay, so I digress. Let's go back to the steps. So what we're doing is um, we need to map a URL here. So we need to add a URL inside our publish app. So I like to create a urls.py file here. And then inside that urls.py file, I'm going to add a quick little doc strings just to say um, URL mapping for the publish app. And then from django.urls import path, from publish import views, and then URL, URL patterns. Oops, URL patterns equals path and then just the empty string here, views.index and name equals index. So this is a URL that maps the root uh, URL because there's nothing specified to views.index, which is the view we just created. And then we just need to wire that URLs file up to our main URLs, which is inside app slash app slash urls.py. So we're going to add a new line here. It says path and then um, include and then publish.urls. And I'm going to include this here. So path 
and then include or import this here. So this says include our publish.urls file into the URL mappings here. So it basically connects the root URLs to the URLs we define here. Next, what we are going to do is just quickly test this locally. So if you have your server running, it should auto refresh and then you should just be able to go and refresh the page and it says hello publish page and it just renders whatever you put inside index. So we have our app. This is what we're gonna deploy first. So the next step, we need to install the software that's required to run this in production. So what we require is the uh, G Unicorn or Gunicorn, however you wanna call it, WSGI server that allows us to run our Django app in a production environment because as I mentioned earlier, it's not recommended that you use the, um, the Django development server in production. Okay, so let's just quickly go over to our requirements.txt and we're gonna add G Unicorn equal equal 20.1.0. And then we're going to go into Docker file and uh, we're gonna add, or actually let's in the root of the project, add a new folder called scripts. And inside scripts, add run.sh. And now we're gonna type hash exclamation mark forward slash bin forward slash sh set hyphen e and g unicorn hyphen b colon 80 hyphen hyphen ch dir forward slash app and then app dot wsgi colon application so this is the command that starts uh, the unicorn whiskey service so this just says it's a shell script this says if any of the commands we run in this file fail, then cancel the whole thing so that we know the error occurred. This is the name of the application we're running. Hyphen B is for bind. We want to bind it to a port. Port colon 80, which is the HTTP port. Port, sorry. And then we have um, chdir, which is change to directory, forward slash app, and then the app, the whiskey application. So let's carry on. So um, next we need to open up Dockerfile and we are going to add a copy command here to say copy dot forward slash scripts to forward slash scripts and then run chmord hyphen r and then plus x forward slash scripts. And then to env here, we're going to change this to forward slash scripts colon. So you got forward slash scripts colon forward slash pi dot bin. Uh, and what this does is basically we have scripts. So this is the directory we created and um, that copies it to our Docker image. And then we're making sure it's executable. So we're doing chmod uh, hyphen r um, uh, plus x means executable and forward slash scripts. And then what we're doing is adding it to the path here. So we're adding scripts to the path so we can run this in our container. Okay, so what we are doing now is we're just gonna go ahead and test this. So I think this is all we need to do to set it up for deployment. So we'll go ahead and do run and we're going to run uh, the build command. So docker build hyphen t publish that's the tag so this says we want to build our container in the root of our project and we're going to do uh, hyphen t publish which means tag it as publish and then dot just means from the current context current context means current uh, root directory that we're in and then what we do is we're just going to type docker run hyphen p 8181 colon 80 hyphen e allowed hosts equals localhost publish. And what this is gonna do is it is going to um, tell us whether our uh, Docker, whether, whether it's working basically, whether our um, setup that we've got is working. So if we open up the browser, we do localhost 8181. It says it can't be reached. So what happened here? So um, I think I typed something wrong here. Docker run hyphen p 8181 colon 80 hyphen e 
allowed hosts equals local host publish um, publish oh I, I know what we did wrong so we we forgot a step so I think we need to add a couple more lines here sorry expose 80 so it just says expose point 80 this is in docker file and then cmd uh, forward slash scripts forward slash run dot sh this will work okay so what this does is it says we're going to run this on port 80 and we're going to run cmd forward slash scripts slash run dot sh and it runs a script basically that we created that runs g unicorn so let's go back here let's uh, rebuild so docker build hyphen t publish dot and then uh, docker run hyphen p 8181 colon 80 hyphen e allowed hosts equals local host publish so this starts the server now we go here and refresh you can see that it's running and this is running exactly as it's going to run on light cell so we can close that off that was just a little test and unfortunately you can't I can't control C this, um, it doesn't seem to, to work for me. So the way I stop it is I type docker ps and I just stop it. So I do um, the container ID here, I do docker stop and then the ID. And this should stop the container for us. There's some, someone someone pointed out a potential typo, should, should be pg is ready, not pg is ready. Oh, ps is ready, yes. You're right, good job, that, that you did spot that well. I think I already corrected that, but yeah, you're right. Well, good for you for, for spotting it as we go along. Okay, so um, we have the container all ready to go. The next step is to actually get this set up and deployed to AWS. So you need to make sure that you are authenticated with AWS on your local CLI in order for us to push the container. So um, what you can do is you can head over to your AWS console let me just see if I'm still logged in here. So you want to head over to your AWS console. I'm assuming you have a root login. I have a special login that I'm using just for this with limited permissions as per like best practices. I'm assuming you as a developer just following this at home is using a, um, a root login perhaps. So um, what you would do is go to, to the IAM dashboard and you should, you should be using... When I say a root login, I mean you should be using an IAM account with admin access. You shouldn't be using the root login that you use your email address and password for. That is a real no-no. You should always set up a separate user inside users that you use for connecting locally and stuff like that. You should never use your root account because then if you accidentally lose access to that account, then you, your whole account gets taken over as opposed to just a IAM user inside that account. So I have a user set up. I assume you have a user set up as well. When you're logged in as that user, you can go to the dashboard and you should be able to see my security credentials. And then in my security credentials, you should be able to see the uh, multi-factor devices. So I here have a multi-factor device set up. This is so that we can use multi-factor authentication locally on our machine. This is optional, but it's highly recommended that you do this. So if you haven't already got this set up and you're not familiar with it, then don't worry about it for now. I would just go ahead and, and use whatever preferred approach you do. But then make sure after you follow this that you do go ahead and set that up because it prevents your account getting hacked and you losing thousands of dollars to a hacker like mining Bitcoin using uh, EC2 instances or something like that. So you really want to make sure you have multi-factor on all of your accounts that you use. Once you have the account set up, you should be able to go into like your account page, which you can access either through users as I said, I don't have permissions for this on this account. You can access it through users or um, I think that's probably the only place you can access it. But you want to be able to see your AWS key and secret key. And that will allow you to authenticate locally. So assuming you have AWS Vault installed, you can go ahead and type AWS Vault add and then the name of the account that you want to use. So mine's called Mark Lightsell Demo. And I've already set this up, so I don't need to go through this now. But if you follow this instruction, you can paste in your access key. You can paste in your secret key that you can get from your AWS console. And it will set this up for you. And then if you want to set up um, MFA, multi-factor authentication, you go VI or you, you want to open the AWS config. So after you add AWS Vault, the um, AWS forward slash config, which is 
the dot aws directory should be in your home directory whether you're on windows mac or linux and it's the configuration for your aws accounts locally it creates this automatically when you add it to aws vault so under that you just add the configuration settings so we've got region this is the default region i'm using and it's good to set a default region otherwise when you create things in different regions it, it won't work so i've got default region as eu west 2 which is the london region and that's the closest one to me and then i've got mfa serial here so i add mfa serial and then paste in the arn um, number for my account so i got that from this page here so this just allows me to set up multi-factor authentication basically okay so let's continue I'm going to assume you'll have this set up and then we can run we can build the image again so we need to build the image that we're going to push to light sale that we're going to use to um, basically deploy the app so because i'm using the m1 architecture processor i need to do it slightly differently if you're not using m1 and you're using any x86 processor base you don't need to do this extra step but i just need to type docker build hyphen t publish uh, for, uh, hyphen hyphen platform x86 underscore 64 and all this does is it builds the container again but uses this architecture the the architecture that is supported by um, AWS light cell so by default it will install it in your own architecture which if you're using the m1 or the apple silicon processors it builds it in that architecture and then if you try and push it to AWS um, light cell it doesn't run because it doesn't support that architecture but you can specify platform and then the architecture here in order to get that to work then what we do is we're going to type AWS vault exec which means we want to execute commands and then the um, basically the name of the account that we just created so whichever name you gave up here so mine's mark light sale demo and then hyphen hyphen duration equals i'm going to put eight hours just so it, the stream's not going to last eight hours but i just want to make sure that it doesn't run out during and then you put in your password and then it should it doesn't return anything but it, it authenticates in the background so our session is now authenticated with aws and we can interact with the aws cli so what i'm going to do now is um, i'm going to do AWS light sale push container image hyphen hyphen service name publish and before I continue we're actually going to go ahead to our light sale page so I open up light sale this is what it looks like if you haven't seen it so um, you can see they offer containers now which is exactly what we're using I'm just going to close this for now and click on containers and we're going to basically do create container service. I'm going to use the cheapest one. Sorry, I was wrong. It's not $5, it's $7 USD for the cheapest possible option. And then I'm going to give it a name. I'm just going to call it publish. And I am going to, uh, what, am I, what am I going to do next? That's basically, I'm going to do create container service. And Make sure you create it in the region that you're in. So um, you want to create it in the, in the correct region. It gives you the option to change the region here. I'm using EU West 2, so it should be the region you configured in your AWS config. But this takes um, a minute to, um, to create, so we'll let that create. In the meantime, let's go ahead and add a database. And the reason why I say this is because the database takes like 15 minutes to create um, on AWS. So it takes a very, very long time. So we're going to go ahead and get a head start on that, even though we don't need it just yet. But you go over to the uh, database tab, create database, Postgres, and we are going to just use the um, the one that's available in the free tier. So this will be free if you or free for the first three months if you're using the free tier. Otherwise, it'll be fifteen dollars a month. So I'm going to give the database a name, and we're going to call it Publish DB, and then just go ahead and click Create. So get that going because that's going to take that takes like 15 minutes so it's just an unfortunate thing with this platform is it seems to take a very long time to create these databases okay while that's going let's go ahead and see if our app's ready so you can see this is ready and we can then go back and finish the command to push so we're doing aws light cell push container image 
service name publish, which is the name of the service we created. So if you use a different name, then obviously change the name accordingly. And then we will do hyphen hyphen label. This is just to give it a label. We'll call it um, V1. And then hyphen hyphen image publish colon latest. So this is the tag that we created up here for our container image. Okay, so we hit enter on that. You see, I get this error here. So this is because I think I'm using the Kalima um, thing. You might not have got this error if you're using Docker desktop, if not great. The way I fix this is I do docker context ls. And then I just need to copy this, um, this string here under Kalima. So I copy this and I do export docker underscore host equals Unix. Actually, just paste it in. You don't need to type the whole thing. So docker underscore host equals and then paste it in. Okay, now run it again. Run the uh, AWS light cell push container image and then the um, service name publish. We'll push that. Okay, so this pushed pretty quickly. It said, I think the layers mostly existed from a previous uh, run through I did of this. Um, yours might take a little bit longer, but it should happen. It should push all of your local image that you built up to publish. You should actually be able to see it here. If you click on images, you can see it here that's been pushed. It seems to increment this every time for the account, which is fine. But basically yours might look slightly different, but it should look generally like this. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna deploy this. So if you go to deployments tab and you create your first deployment, container name, we're gonna call this, um, we're gonna call this uh, app, APP. You can leave the image or you can click the image, click, uh, stored image and choose the one we just pushed. Leave the launch command as it is and add environment variable. We need to do, D, uh, what do we need to add here? We basically need to do allowed underscore hosts. And the allowed host is gonna be the uh, public domain here that we're using. So paste that in, make sure there's no spaces at the start or end. There you go. And then what we'll do is map the port. So we want port 80 and we wanna specify the container here. So what this does is we are saying we wanna run a container. You can run any, you can run multiple containers in a deployment, but we're just gonna run one. So we're running a container called app. We've chosen the image that we pushed up from our local machine. And then we um, have specified the allowed hosts, which is the required, um, yeah, sorry, I, I think the, the terminal code was behind my head for a bit, but I'll make sure that it's not. So if you missed the command before, it is uh, this command here. AWS light cell, push container image, service name, publish, label V1, image, publish latest. Uh, so yeah, let's continue. Basically the allowed host is the configuration for our allowed host that we need to specify in settings.py. So that's to add this and it allows us to access it on the domain we specify. So this is all we need to do here. The, um, this is the configuration essentially. So this is where we can add configuration variables to our app. Port 80 is the HTTP port and then we're, we're mapping that app container to the public endpoint. So the public endpoint is the endpoint that's accessible on the internet. And when we visit that, it's gonna forward all the requests to the app container. So if that's all set, you can click save and deploy. And then what we'll do is we just wait a minute and it will go ahead and deploy this app and we should be able to access it on this URL. If you try and access it now, you can see it says no service because it's still deploying. It takes a couple minutes to deploy. So let's take a look at the, um, the next step. Um, but yeah, we'll basically just wait for this to, to run. Um, if you open up the log here, you can see the current log. So nothing's available right now. It does take a minute for it to spin up. But what AWS is doing now is it's spinning up a new container with the uh, configuration that we specified. So the image and the configuration and stuff like that. And it's gonna make it accessible and we should just be able to see our simple page that we created. So one of the things that uh, people ask all the time, which we'll go into next, is um, basically uh, the static files. So we're gonna, 
because we're running in containers, we need a way to be able to store and serve the static files for the user. And we're gonna be doing that using S3. So we're gonna create an S3 storage bucket, and that's gonna allow us to put in a bunch of static files and media files that we can then serve in our application. And we can make those static files public so they're publicly accessible. Okay, so let's see if this has progressed. You can see it's moved to the next step because it is um, creating our deployment. Okay, so if we refresh this page, you can see it's changed a little bit, service unavailable. Um, this means that it's it's getting there, it's starting to progress. Um, it does take a minute, but the good thing about this is that once it's running, it looks like it might be running now. So once it's running, um, maybe it just needs to switch the load balancer basically, it still says deploying here. So it, it automatically handles the kind of load balancing and stuff for you. So it, it creates a new domain and it maps it to the correct container and stuff like that. And then when you spin up new containers, it will wait until the new container is running before the old one shuts down. So it will wait until the new one is up and running and successful before the old one um, uh, is spun down. And this means that you have like zero downtime deployments essentially. So you don't have to wait and like close the application and then start a new application. I mean, you should have zero downtime deployments. So we'll see if this is um, progressing any further. No, it's still, it's still running. So we refresh. Okay, there are a couple of, of questions here. Uh, please make a video on containerizing the um, the Django with MongoDB. Yeah, okay, um, that's an interesting suggestion. Thanks, thanks for the suggestion. We'll um, we'll keep that in mind for the future content. I, I haven't used MongoDB much really, so I might not be the best person to create that. But um, we can th we can have a think about it, and um, yeah, we'll see if we if we get capacity and and we get like more more demand for that. Then um, yeah, we'll look at it for sure. The other one is like, are we planning on doing a course on Kubernetes? Um, I don't have any plans right now, but people, a couple of people have suggested that. So um, yeah, we will think about it and, and we will likely do something like that in the future. Okay, so if you refresh now, it should be deployed. Excuse me, the, uh, the cough is back. Okay, so let's continue. So that's a basic container deployed. Now I know that you're obviously gonna need a database for your application, so we'll take a look at that next. So what we're going to do now is um, basically configure our application to use a database. So the code change is very small. I'll just commit this code. Let's see what did we change here. So um, added publish app. I'll commit and push this for you to view. So this is the, the code so far. So what we'll do next is we're going to configure uh, RDS so that we actually can use the database with our application. So open the project again. We just need to make a quick one line change to the scripts. So open up scripts run.sh and we're going to do python manage.py migrate. So this runs the manage.py migration command before we uh, run gunicorn. Basically we are going to run this as part of the deployment process so the database migrations gets applied. So we just need to build this and uh, push it to Lysel. So we'll do docker build hyphen t publish hyphen hyphen platform x86 underscore 64 and then dot. The same command as before. Build in the image. You don't need this platform if you are using x86 unless you, you only use this platform if you are using a uh, Mac OS with the Apple Silicon. And now we can type AWS Lightsail push container image hyphen hyphen service name publish hyphen hyphen label i'll label this as v2 and then hyphen hyphen image publish colon layers this is going to uh, push the container up again so with the new changed run script and then we can go to bray uh, so the, the browser again what we're going to do next is um we are going to configure the database. So we have everything set up and ready to go. The only thing that's probably not set up and ready to go is RDS because it is super, super slow. Oh, it's ready, okay. Maybe it's faster than I thought. Usually it takes like 15 minutes, but maybe it has been 15 minutes, I don't know. Okay, so let's go ahead and configure this. So we go back to home containers 
the publish deployment or um, the publish container. And then we go modify. And then we're going to go add variable. And we're gonna do db underscore name. And this will be the database name. So by default, it creates a database name called db master. And then um, that's just the default name that it creates in RDS when you first create a new instance, unless you specify a custom one. And then db underscore host, we're gonna give it the host name of the database. So we can get that by opening up a new tab and that new tab, we're gonna click on databases and we're gonna go over to, we're gonna open up our database here and it gives you the endpoint here. So this is the host name of our database. By default, it's only accessible by our light cell containers. So I can show you the password, even though it's not recommended, I can share the password and you won't be able to access it because it is um, all firewalled behind the light cell container instances. So unless I specifically make it public, it won't be accessible to anything except my light cell resources. So I can configure the host, the DB host, paste that in there, make sure there's no spaces at the end or start. And then DB underscore uh, user, and the default user it creates is DB master user. I think you can override these when you create the instance if you wanna change the name to something more applicable to the application. And then we type in DB pass, db underscore pass. And if you go to your page here, you can expose the password. Again, you're not supposed to share the password in any situation, however, because this is protected, it should be fine. I trust you guys. And then we'll go ahead and paste that in here. And this will allow us to deploy the change. So remember to change the image to the one we just pushed, so 37 or the, whichever the latest one is that you just pushed. And then go ahead and click Save and Deploy and it's gonna run a new deployment. So it's gonna keep the old one active, as I was explaining earlier. You can still access this, this page, and it's going to deploy the, um, the new container with a new configuration that should run the, the database setup. So that's gonna go ahead and run in the background. While we're waiting for that, let's go ahead and make the next change, because I'm just conscious that we have around 30 minutes before it is the full two hours. And I wanna make sure we get to at least to static files and stuff, because I know that's really important to people. So that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at next. So we'll leave this deploy in. We're not expecting the app to change. All we're expecting is that in the logs, you should be able to see um, that the migrations have been applied. So we'll come back to this and we'll look at it in a minute. For now, let's go back to our code. I'm just gonna um, commit this change git commit am um, this is the uh, migrate command push okay so what we'll do next is we're going to configure static files so the way that the static and media files is going to work is it's going to use s3 and then when we're running locally we're just going to use the local file system but when we're running it in um, production or in our light cell environment it's going to use s3 to store the uh, files so store the static files and store the media files so we can use something called django storages which is a python library that we can install and we can use and we can also use botto3 which is the kind of underlying back end that allows uh, python to communicate with aws so open up requirements.txt, I'm gonna add two new requirements here, django-storages equal equals 1.13.1, .1, and then botto3 equal equals 1.26.33, and this is just the latest version available at the time of recording this, which is now because it's live. And then what we're gonna do is um, we are going to add a backend to configure the uh, location. So by default, you can't configure the location inside the S3 bucket that these files are stored unless you create your own backend. And it's also um, allows us to set the default access control list or the default access configuration. So inside app, I'm gonna create a new file called S3 underscore backends.py. And then we are going to add just a quick dot string here, custom storage backends for S3, and we'll create a class, so class static S3 storage, 
and we will import. So we'll do from storages backends s3 botto3 import s3 botto3 storage. All right, and then we'll we'll, we'll um, base our new class on that botto3 storage, and we'll do location equals static. Oops, static and default underscore ACL equals public underscore read. And then we're gonna copy this. Uh, you could type it out if you prefer. I'm gonna copy and paste. And we're gonna change the stack in this one to media. So this is gonna be for static files and this is gonna be for media files. So this location is static. This location we want to be, can you guess, media. And we both want them to be public read. So this means they're publicly readable by the public internet because uh, it's no good if they're private because then you can't, you can't view them in, in the interface. So now that we have this back end, we need to configure it in the settings. So open up settings.py and in the interest of time, I'm gonna do both static and media at the same time. So we're gonna come down to the bottom and we're gonna add static, uh, sorry, media underscore URL equals media forward slash. And all this means is it configures Django to say that the static files will be available under the URL static and the media files will be available under the URL media. And it just separates the two so it's easy to distinguish. And just for those who don't know, static files are files that are generated at build time. So like CSS, JavaScript images, as it says here. Media files are files that are uploaded or set during runtime. So that's things like users uploading a profile picture or uploading a file to a system or something where you're doing while the app is running. So you can configure both of these and they're both very useful and very often required in most Django apps. So this says what URLs are gonna be available. Now we need, to, we need to configure the backend to use the S3 backend when we're running on LightSail or the local backend when we're running on local development. Just a quick little tangent is there's there's an issue with the um, Django. Django has a feature called um, CRF tokens. It's a basically cross-site scripting token protection. So it adds a token to all the forms that you enter in Django that give you uh, some security to make sure someone's not trying to inject stuff into your site. So it's, it's all explained on the um, Django site if you look up CSRF tokens. But what it means is that when you're running in this environment, if you go to forward slash admin, you can see the static files aren't working yet because there's no CSS here. But if you fill out this with some random content, it says forbidden. And that's because the a certain header is not being passed through or not being passed through properly from the load balancer that AWS LightSales is using in the back end to the app that we're running. So the way that we can get around that is we just type a setting in here called secure underscore proxy underscore SSL underscore header equals and then um, in quotes, HTTP underscore X underscore forwarded, forwarded underscore proto, and then HTTPS. And this just fixes that issue where it doesn't use the, or the cross-site verification doesn't work properly. Okay, so that's just a little tangent there. We just might as well add it now as we're adding the other configuration to our settings. So what we'll do next is we are going to configure the um, S3 backend when we're in production mode. So the way we'll do that is we'll do if and then os.environ.get and then is underscore on underscore AWS is a string called zero. Make sure it's in a string. Or oh, that's the default value is a string that is zero. Equal equals one. And then colon and what we're saying here is that we're going to get the environment variable is on AWS, which we can create for our AWS deployment. And if that is set to zero, which is the default, which will be local development, then we're not going to do this. If it is set to one, then we are going to run these lines of code here. So this is essentially to customize the configuration on LightSail versus on the local machine. So we'll do default underscore file underscore storage equals and then app dot s3 underscore backends dot media s3 storage and then static files 
storage equals app dot s3 underscore backends dot static s3 storage and then aws underscore storage underscore bucket underscore name equals and then the uh we're going to get os dot environ dot get the aws underscore storage underscore bucket underscore name and then we'll do uh, AWS default ACL equals public under, uh, public hyphen read, and then AWS query string auth equals false. So probably you don't need both this and this. Um, I should test this. I think this is redundant actually. I think both of them do the same thing. So probably we can remove this, but I'm going to leave it in for now. Feel free to play around and experiment, and if you don't need it, then um, you know we, we can we can just remove it. But we'll leave it in for now, just um, to keep it consistent with the code that I provided. I'll just talk through what these are. So default file storage says the default file storage is going to be our app dot s3 backends dot media s3 storage. That's this one, and then um, the static file storage is going to be app s3 backends dot static s3 storage which is the static one this one so it just configures the backends here basically for the storage and then um we're going to have aws storage bucket name we're going to get the name of the storage bucket from our configuration and we don't need to specify the key and the secret key because we configure that in environment variables there are default environment variables that are documented or that that boto3 uses by default that are going to match the ones that we're going to provide so we don't need to specify this manually here we just need to specify the bucket name okay and we're just going to have a little else here so underscore else media underscore root equals forward slash app forward slash media and all this does is it says if we are not in AWS, so we're running locally, we're just going to use a local media route so we can use the local file system. Okay, so that should be all we need to do here in order to get this to work. We can, um, we can now go ahead and push this. Or let's just see if there's any more steps, actually. So I think maybe... Oh, there is one more thing we want to do. So we want to open up scripts slash uh, run... And we're just going to add a new thing above this that says python manage.py collect static hyphen hyphen no input. And what this does is it says during the startup process, we're going to run collect static and we're going to pass in no input. So that says basically we're not going to give any input to this command, but it's going to gather up all of our static files and it's going to dump them all in S3 to make them accessible. So let's continue. What we're going to do now is let's create our S3 bucket. So we want to go over to our publish app, go over to storage. So AWS light cell, storage, and then the bucket, just create a new bucket in the region. This actually costs $1 a month, so it's cheaper than I thought. So that balances out the containers that cost uh, $7 instead of $5. So um, yeah, okay, that, that, that means my estimate was about right. All right, so identifying the bucket, you can give it a name if you want. This is unique globally. So if, if I give it the name uh, and you give it a name and you're in the same region, then the name's not going to work. So I'm just going to leave it at this auto-generated one and click on create bucket. And this will create a new AWS bucket. And then what we'll do is um, click on permissions and all objects are private. So we need to make some of the objects public in order to make them publicly accessible in our app. So if you click change permissions and you can click individual objects can be made public and read only and click save. It'll give you a warning here. You can click yes because we do definitely want some things to be public. And this is the configuration setup for our bucket. So we should be ready to configure our app now. Let's go ahead and um, build and push our container again. So I open up my terminal and I'm going to do docker build hyphen t publish hyphen hyphen platform x86 underscore 64 and then dot and then we're going to build that again okay and then we're going to do aws light sail push container image hyphen hyphen service hyphen name publish hyphen hyphen label v3 and then hyphen hyphen image publish colon latest 
which is the one we just built. Hit enter on that, and it should go ahead and push the container. Okay, great, it's pushed it. And now we can go ahead and configure our app. So what we'll do is we're gonna to need to go to the containers again. We're gonna click on publish. Before we do this, we'll just see if our um, new container ran the migrations, and you can see here that it did run the migrations. So the database changes that we were making before the static files did work, and um, you can see that the migrations were applied. But now we're gonna click on modify your deployment, and we're gonna add some uh, more settings here. So first we're gonna add an, a variable called is underscore on underscore AWS, and we'll set that to just the number one. And then we'll do AWS under, underscore storage underscore bucket underscore name, and that's gonna equal the bucket name that we created. So just close these tabs here. I'm gonna open a new tab on home. We're gonna go and get the name of the bucket we just created. That is this bucket 7Y43E7. This will be different for you. You will need to specify the bucket you created. So paste that in, make sure there's no space before because sometimes it adds that. And then add another variable. This one is gonna be AWS underscore S3 underscore access underscore key underscore ID. And this is the access key ID. Unfortunately, there's no um, automated permissions set up with the buckets and the container services. So you, you can do it with the virtual machines that you can create. So you can create a bucket that is assigned to a virtual machine and you don't need to set up authentication for. But unfortunately, they haven't added that for containers yet. I expect they will add that at some point in the future. So when you create a bucket or a disk, you can assign that to the containers. But for now, the only way that you can allow your container to authenticate with your bucket is by opening your bucket and going permissions and scrolling down and doing access keys and choosing create access key. And as it says, this will only be displayed one time. So when you click yes, create, it gives you a new access key ID and a secret key. Now I'm not gonna show you the secret key because the secret key is publicly accessible and I don't want any, everyone to be dumping stuff into the bucket I create, even though it's not really that much, it's not really that bad if that happens because I'm just gonna delete it right after the stream anyway. But for now, I'm just gonna um, keep the secret key hidden. But what we do here is we're gonna copy the access key and keep this open because you're gonna need this in a sec. So copy the access key and paste it into this variable that we just added, which is AWS S3 access key ID. And then we're gonna add uh, another variable and oops, someone's pointed out a typo. Um, should be is on AWS. Yeah, nice. Thank you for pointing that out. That saves uh, me doing another deployment, which takes like a few minutes. So you just saved us some time. Thanks for that. Okay, so now we have AWS S3 access key ID. It's a bit annoying that these are so small, these keys here. It'd be good if they could expand these. If anyone from AWS watches this, and please allow us to expand these, uh, these, these fields here because you can't read it. The next thing is we're gonna add AWS, AWS underscore S3 underscore secret underscore access underscore key. Okay, so this is the secret access key. This is the one I'm not gonna show you, but what you need to do is go over here, show your key here, and paste it in here, making sure there's no spaces or issues. So you paste in your key, so you do that here. I'm gonna do it different, I'm gonna do it separately on, on a different screen in a minute. Once you've done that, you come down and you hit uh, save and deploy. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna drag this away so you can't see it anymore. And, um, I'm going to copy my secret key and I'm gonna paste that into that field. And then I'm gonna hit um, save and deploy. I can show you this here because you can't see it. So save and deploy. And then it's gonna go ahead and save and deploy the new configured application. And our static files should be built and stored inside our um, our bucket. So we'll wait for that to continue. What we'll actually do while we're waiting for that is we'll go over to the code and just so I can show you media files working as well, 
I'm going to skip some of the steps I have planned because we only have 15 minutes left. But I'm just going to show you if you open up models.py, then we'll just create a model here. And that model is going to be just a simple model um, that lets us upload a file, an image file. And then I can at least show you that working. So then we can we can kind of touch all of the things that we said we would do. So I'm just looking at my reference code here. So what we're going to do is type a couple of imports here. So import uh, from UUID import UUID for and then import OS. And then what we'll do is DEF post image path instance comma file name. And this will be generate path for post image using UUID to ensure to, to ensure uniqueness. EXT equals OS dot path dot split text file name one and then return OS dot path dot join posts F and then um, UUID four call that as a function and then EXT that should be in the quotes here. So what this is, is a function that is going to be used to generate the path name for our new posts. So now we can just do class post models dot model. And we'll just create a simple model and we'll do author name uh, equals models dot char field max length equals 255 and then title equals models dot char field max length equals 255 and then content equals models dot text field and then image equals models dot image field upload underscore two equals post image path. So this creates a new post model, which is a table in the database. We got a few fields here, author name, title, content, image, and the image is uh, uses the post image path to generate the unique URL for our images. So then just go over to the admin.py and type admin.site.register. And in there we're gonna we're gonna first import. So we'll do from publish.models import post. We're just gonna add post here. This registers it with the Django admin, which we can use in a minute. Okay, so that we'll just we'll do that for now and we'll push it up and we'll just test it in the Django admin. So this is deploying. Let's see how this is going and refresh the page. So active, so it deployed successfully. If I open the log, you can see if you look here, it says that um, oh, it didn't it didn't create. I forgot I forgot a step basically. So what we needed to do was um, we needed to do modify deployment, and I forgot to add this image here. So you need to up you need to bump this image to the new one that we pushed. So change the image, and then we're going to go save and deploy. And this time it should hopefully copy the stack files to the right location. So we'll wait for that to finish. While we're waiting for that, we're going to go ahead and build these changes that we have. So we'll do Docker compose. We need to create our migrations for the new model that we just added. So Docker compose run hyphen hyphen rm app sh hyphen c python manage.py make migrations. And we're going to make the migrations. It says we can't use the image field because we need to install pillow. So that's what we need to do next. We need to go to requirements.txt and we need to add pillow, which is a dependency that's needed for the image field. So pillow equal equals 9.4.0. And this is also going to require some additional dependencies inside our Docker file. So open your Docker file. We're going to add um, backslash. And then the dependencies we need for pillow are musl hyphen dev, zlib, zlib hyphen dev, and linux underscore headers. Save that. Go ahead and open the terminal. Docker compose build to rebuild the container with the new uh, dependencies. Um, I should have put an S on linux headers here. Save that. Run the command again. Okay, that worked this time. Now we can run again the um, Docker Compose run 
rm app sh-c python manage.py make migrations. This should make the migrations for the app uh, or for the new model. And then we go ahead and build our container again. So docker build hyphen t publish um, hyphen hyphen platform x ae6 underscore 64 dot build that and then we'll type the aws light sale push container image uh, service name publish label we'll do v4 and an image publish latest we'll hit that and then We'll see this should be available now. So this is the image that has the um, the post container. We'll just see how our other deployment from earlier is going. So we'll open this. So um, I don't think it's uh, created it yet. Let's see. Oh yeah, it has. So 130 static files copied. So this is what we're looking for here. So if we go to home storage and then the bucket, and then objects, you should see the stack files here. And then if you go back to home, containers, publish, and open up the public domain, and then do forward slash admin, um, it should, if you do, uh, you might need to force reload, so command shift and R, or control shift and R if you're on Windows. You should see it look like this, so it looks a lot, a lot nicer. Um, the layout looks styled because the CSS stack files were available. So, the last thing we'll do is we'll create a admin user so we can actually log in here and then we'll go ahead and demonstrate uploading media files. So we just need to go ahead and uh, modify deployment and we, we there's a couple of things we need to do here. So um, one thing is we need to change the stored image to uh, the new image that we just pushed. We can, we can uh, let's, let's do, do that first. So we'll change it to the image we just pushed and click save and deploy. Okay, so we'll wait for that to deploy. And if anyone has any questions in the meantime, I can, I can go and take a look at those. Let's see if there's any, any questions that we have. So, yep, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael or Mikhail, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, that I spelled the is on AWS incorrectly. I appreciate you pointing that out. Cool. So we're 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 almost there. What we what we're going to do next is kind of the last step, so that we can access the Django admin. Now, as I was explaining before earlier on, when we have an RDS database, this database is only accessible via LightSail. So we can't connect to it from our local machine, which would be one way to add the initial administrator configuration for the the admin site so we, we basically need to create a username and password that we can use to log in here but because we can't access the database we can't do that from our local machine so the way that we're going to do it is is kind of a, a hacky approach but it does it does work it works quite well um, after this deployment is done we're going to create a new deployment that simply just creates a user using the environment variable uh, approach of creating a super user so I'll show you what how that works, but basically what we do is we override the entry point command to the create super user command, and we then add different environment variables that specify the user's name, email address, and password. And then when that container runs, it goes ahead and creates a super user, which we can then use to log in with, which then allows us to have an initial user that we can then go and change the password for later. Okay, some, somebody had the question as, I was hoping you could please create another course on using mach ML with Django, which I assume means um, you're referring to machine learning. Um, I don't know if uh, people use Django for machine learning very often. I've not seen it being, maybe, maybe you meant Python in general, like Python for machine learning. If so, then we can take a look at that. Uh, we can see if we can create some content on that for sure. We'll uh, we'll make a note, and um, you know if there's demand for it, and other people are interested, then we'll uh, we'll we'll think about creating something for it. If you have any specific uh, areas of machine learning that you want, then please put them in the in the chat as well, and we can we can look at that. Basically, let's just see where we are here. So if I refresh this, one of the frustrating things with this is you can't modify the deployment until the last thing's been deployed. So once something's been deployed, you can't like stop that and, and, and override it with something else. You have to wait for this to either succeed or fail before you can do the next step. Right now, we're just waiting for this to, 
to go. Let's just see if there's any errors or anything in the um, in the log. This log here doesn't doesn't auto refresh either, which can be a little bit annoying sometimes. I think this is running now because it's about the same time as it is now, which is almost time to finish the stream. Hopefully we can just fit this last bit in. Um, sorry if it feels a bit rushed here. Um, you know, this this was the first stream and we were trying to experiment with how long things take to, to teach and how we can uh, speed things up and make them more concise and stuff. Um, but we'll just wait for this to complete. I don't think we have any other pending questions. Okay, so this is deployed. So it, it hasn't changed anything from the perspective of the app. We just added um, a model. So this is how we're going to add a super user. So I'm gonna do modify deployment. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to add some new variables here. So we're gonna add AW or actually the variable is called Django underscore super user underscore email. And this is gonna be the email for the sample email you wanna create. So I'm gonna do mark at example.com. And then Django, you've got to make sure you spell these right. Django underscore super user underscore username. And this is going to be Mark. And you obviously feel free to use your own name or feel free to use Mark if your name is also Mark. And then we'll do Django underscore super user underscore password. This is going to be the password we put in for the initial site. And then um, once that's done, we're going to just make sure we have the image selected up here. So we're gonna change the launch command here. So the launch command, this is gonna allow us to create a new super user. So we'll do python manage.py create super user hyphen hyphen no input. And it's gonna try and run this and it's gonna fail because it's not actually gonna start the deployment, but then it will just roll back. So that's kind of what we, we want to happen. So I am gonna change this password before I run, just so someone doesn't sneakily log in before me and change it. Um, so I'll do that, but once, once you've set your password and all these details, just go ahead and click save and deploy. And that's what I am going to do now. So set the password and stuff and do save and deploy. And now we are hopefully getting there with the last step. So I can show you this screen again. So we're gonna let this deploy. And as I said, what's gonna happen is it's gonna fail the deployment, but it's gonna run that um, create super user command. And that is effectively gonna give us a user that we can log in with here. We'll just finish this last bit. It should just be a couple more minutes while we wait for this to deploy. So we're gonna go ahead and see what's happening here. So it looks like it's um, getting there. So yeah, it says uh, it's starting to, to run the container hopefully. What we should see here is the um, create super user command run. And that should then, oh, so it says here creating your deployment. So I'll just keep frantically refreshing this until it uh, does something. I am going to see if this works. Uh, do we have any questions? Let's see if there's any questions that people want answering while we're waiting for this. Yes, Jason, Jason Bush, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks for the question. Yes, this will definitely be available in live stream form and will most likely also be available in um, a, a more condensed edited video, which um, Brooke will use her skills to produce. So let's see if the, okay, super user created successfully. Great, so now I can go ahead and type the super user mark and then the, the password, and we'll see if this doesn't work because I've made an error or something, then that, that's a shame. But you can see here, you got the Django admin and here you can manage the users. So if you wanted, you can go and give a proper password to your uh, password uh, user that you created here. And what we're gonna do is just go to posts and show that if you do add post and you just type in like a name, so um, little bird, I call this, and then some content. And then I have a picture here that I took of a small bird that was outside our house one day. We'll save that 
we'll see if this works. Okay, so it created the object. So if you go there and you, you look at the URL, you can see that it renders it under the, the media sub URL. So this is basically everything that I was gonna show you. I was hoping we would have time to actually produce a small app that we could use the inter in the interface to actually upload a file. Um, we haven't got time there, but we have covered all of the topics that we said we were gonna cover, which is deploying to AWS LightSail, creating and using static media files, setting up the Django admin, setting up a database, uploading, the, handling the static files, and also handling the media files. So hopefully that gives everyone um, a good starting point for setting up an app and deploying it to LightSail. The code is available in the description of this video. So if you just want to access the code and you wanna use that as a template for your project, then feel free. If you have any feedback or comments, well, before, before we go into that, I'll just show you quickly in um, home slash storage, uh, the bucket, you can go to objects and you can see in the media files that you actually have the post subdirectory and then the files that have been uploaded. So this is what we uploaded earlier and that we can see in the Django admin. This is a little blurry photo of this tiny little bird that I saw outside the house. And this, yeah, this demonstrates that the basics that you would need in an app are working, the uh, database is there, the media files is there, um, uh, the static files are there, and you've got the Django admin, and then you can hopefully have a nice starting point to go ahead and continue building up the, um, the application from this page. So you should be able to use all of the basic features of Django. Thanks again for watching. This has been quite a long stream. I hope that you found this useful. Um, I'm gonna stick around for a couple of minutes in case any other questions come in that people wanna ask in the last minute. Um, but if you do, if you do have any feedback or anything that you want or any topics that you want covering, please leave them in the comments. Yeah. So, uh, that's a great question, Ryan. Thanks a lot. Um, so any reason you're using Kalima instead of Docker? So why am I using Kalima instead of Docker? That's a really, really good question. Uh, basically, um, I used to use Docker desktop and I, I had a license for Docker desktop for Docker desktop. You now need a license if you're working on projects for like a client that is over a certain size and um, that policy is often set by the client themselves and I didn't want to put any risk of liability of not having the proper licensing so even though I'm eligible for the free use because we're, we're a small business we don't meet the threshold that requires a license for Docker desktop I use Kalima because it's a free alternative that doesn't require a license because when I'm working on client projects they're not always willing to buy licenses for the project. So that's the main reason. I mean, I did used to just have the license myself and just pay the $7 or it's just, I don't know how much it is. It's, it's not very expensive at all, but um, I, yeah, I've just recently got used to using Kalima, uh, which I find is a, a nice, useful free alternative that you can use. Um, but I will say that Docker desktop is way better for like having the graphical user interface being able to set everything up so easily without having to, um, you know, faff around with different settings and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, if you if you don't have a reason not to use Docker Desktop, then I definitely would recommend using Docker Desktop. Cool. So hopefully that answers all your questions. We do uh, look forward to hopefully doing another stream at some point in the future. So if you want to, you know, if there's anything particularly you want to learn and you found this useful, then please let us know. And if you didn't find it useful, you can also let us know that too. And then. Uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time <laughs> doing this. So um, we'll be, uh, so uh, Javorg, that's another question. So thanks, we'll, we'll be Django actual in future. I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand what you're asking there, but um, if you're asking like, will Django be used in the future? Yeah, I think it will be used in the future. Um, it's one of the most popular frameworks. Yeah, there's lots of different alternatives and stuff. Um, and there are many different things that come out all the time, but Django has kind of been a consistent, one for people that want something that you can get up and running with very fast. You can scale to uh, production, like, you know, handling hundreds of thousands or millions of users if you need to and you want to configure it that way. Um, yeah, I think Django doesn't seem to be going anywhere for the near, near term. It has Django REST framework, which is really excellent for using, um, creating REST APIs. It gives you lots of stuff out of the box that make it really pleasant to build REST APIs for your, uh, front-end application and the Django admin. I really haven't found anything that kind of matches the Django admin in terms of the um, saving time with creating an admin interface. 
uh, even with Ruby on Rails, I've, I've been using that a lot lately. Yeah, there are external uh, things you can add to it that give you an admin interface, but nothing quite like the Django admin that's like fully integrated, works out of the box, it's really easy to use. Maybe stuff does exist. If it does, then I'd be interested to hear about it. Yeah, I, I really enjoy using Django. Popularity of it doesn't seem to be decreasing, although there is lots of things, um, you know, that come on the market all the time. So who, who knows really what the future will be. I do think Django is, is here for a while at least. Cool, so Brooks just reminded me, don't forget to recap. So I'll just, I, th I think I did recap, but I'll just recap um, again. So what we've done is we've created a Django app we have uh, set up the Docker kind of locally for local development so that we have a development environment using Docker and Docker Compose. We have then set up uh, AWS LightSail container deployment, which we pushed from our local machine to AWS LightSail. And then we created an RDS database, which stores all of the data for the system. And we set up a st uh, storage for our static and media files. We configured all this and deployed it to a container and then we kind of demonstrate it working in the Django admin interface. Okay, so I think that is everything. Um, I can, yeah, it's, I see Brooks asked me to, to show the, the PowerPoint again. So yeah, we'll just, this is what we covered basically. So here's a recap of everything we covered. So um, we covered creating the Django app locally um, deploying to AWS LightSail containers, setting up a database using Django Admin, and handling media file uploads using S3. And that's basically everything. All right, so I think we'll leave it there then. Thanks everyone again for joining. I really appreciate it. It's been, um, you know, it's not, it wasn't a short one. So um, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. And I hope to see you again soon in a future stream or in future content. Thank you, bye.